Uh, I've spent almost equal amounts of time living in the United States and China, bouncing between continents uh, as a Canadian, observing the two most thrilling, maddening, and uh, honestly, bizarre places on the planet. Uh, most headlines you read today announce that uh, officials from the US and China are once more butting heads. Uh, and when I see this, uh, I feel it's more than just tragic. It's also comical. It's comical because I am convinced that no two peoples are more alike than Americans and Chinese. We share a strain of crass materialism, manifesting sometimes as a veneration of the successful entrepreneur and sometimes as a display of extraordinary tastelessness. We are pragmatic. We have a get it done attitude that occasionally results in hurried work. Both countries are full of hustlers hawking shortcuts, whether to health or to wealth. And we share an appreciation for the technological sublime, the awe inspired by grand projects that push physical limits. In short, both countries are messy, vibrant engines for global change. But here is where the tragedy sets in. Masses and elites in both countries are united in the faith that theirs is a uniquely powerful nation that ought to throw its weight around. And now we are in an era where the two countries regard each other with suspicion and often animosity. We are reconfiguring the international order and, in the process, each other. For years, I worked as a technology analyst for an investment research firm serving a clientele of hedge funds and asset managers. They aren't shy about getting to the heart of the matter. They'd ask me, can China's political system truly breed tech giants? Will advanced manufacturing succeed when the rest of the world is throwing up trade barriers? You learn quickly that if you don't offer sharp answers, the conversations feel less like a collegial chat and more like a Socratic beating. My job was to decipher where Xi Jinping was taking China, which meant reading arcane party texts and traveling as often as possible to little known industrial parks and cities. Every journey reaffirmed that China moves with a breathless, sometimes reckless, speed. When I lived there, it was not a contradiction for me to appreciate that things were getting better and getting worse simultaneously. China boasts strong entrepreneurs and a strong government. It is a, a state that both moves fast and breaks things and moves fast and breaks people. And here lies the starkest, most useful contrast between us, the one that defines the 21st century geopolitical competition. It is a competition between an American elite made up mostly of lawyers who excel at obstruction, uh, a Chinese technocratic class made up mostly of engineers uh, who excel at construction. Uh, China is an engineering state uh, building big at breakneck speed. Uh, the United States is a lawyerly society, uh, often blocking everything it can, uh, good and bad. This is the new lens through which we must understand the future of the two superpowers. Let's start with the clearest, most infuriating example of this contrast. Uh, I want to talk about trains. In the year 2008, voters in California approved a state proposition to fund a high-speed rail link between San Francisco and Los Angeles. That very same year, China began construction of its high-speed rail line between Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, both lines were designed to be about 800 miles long upon completion. China opened its Beijing-Shanghai line just three years later, uh, in 2011, at a cost of $36 billion. In its first decade of operation, it completed 1.35 billion passenger trips. Now, where is California's line 17 years after the ballot proposition? California has managed to build a small stretch of rail to connect two cities in the Central Valley, neither of which are close to San Francisco or Los Angeles. The latest estimate for this incomplete line is a staggering $128 billion. Why so expensive? Uh, partly because politicians successfully demanded the line take a more torturous route through an extra mountain range to add a stop in their district. And partly because the rail authority prefers to tout the number of high paying jobs it is creating rather than the amount of track it has been laying. Uh, the margin of error for estimating when a partial leg of California's high-speed rail will open sometime between 2030 and 2033 is the same time it took China to build the entire Beijing-Shanghai line. This, my friends, is the comical tragedy of our times. 
The United States now lives in the ruins of an industrial civilization where infrastructure is barely maintained and rarely expanded. The lawyers are winning. Um, the lawyerly society operates on a single principle, process over outcomes. In the United States, we have a government of the lawyers, by the lawyers, and for the lawyers. Five of the last 10 presidents attended law school. In any given year, at least half of the US Congress holds law degrees. By contrast, only two presidents, Herbert Hoover and Jimmy Carter, were engineers, and they are primarily remembered for their dismal political instincts that led to thumping electoral defeats. Our current state of stagnation is a corrective that went too far. In the 1,960 seconds, the U.S. was facing genuine catastrophes. Rivers were combusting from pollution, highways were rammed through urban neighborhoods, and industry regulators were cozying up to corporations. The public grew alarmed, and the focus of elite lawyers turned to litigation and regulation. The new mission was simple, stop as many things as possible. And uh, lawyers have so many tools available to uh, delay or prevent building. In 2019, law professor Nicholas Bagley wrote a seminal paper, which he called The Procedure Fetish. He outlined how the government requires an agency to conduct every conceivable study, engage every identifiable stakeholder, and weather the most stringent judicial review before any action, however trivial, can take effect. In the lawyerly society, the answer to any new problem is merely another, more rigorous procedure. Before a government agency can build anything, whether a complex project like high-speed rail or something as simple as a bike lane, it ties itself down with mountains of procedure. This is driven by the fear that a lawsuit could derail that project if a judge is convinced that the agency didn't study the environmental impact hard enough. After this exhaustive research and review, it is little wonder that almost nothing gets built we are left with decaying infrastructure and a deep sense that nothing is working. The other critical problem of the lawyerly society is a systematic bias toward the well-off. Lawyers are excellent servants of the rich. Um, they help wealthy homeowners successfully block construction projects. They are the masters of the vitocracy. Consider this. Though New York City has struggled to extend its mass transit system, real estate developers have easily managed to build skinny, expensive high-rises for the wealthy. And while California cannot tame its wildfires, the rich can afford private firefighting services. The people who suffer most from the lawyerly society's failures are the poor, those buried under paperwork, applying for benefits, or forced to rely on dilapidated public transit. The U.S. is not a great power if it only caters to the wealthy its failure to build has led to a low agency society. Meanwhile, what was America doing when it was still an engineering state? It was delivering wonders. From the world's longest suspension bridge to the first skyscrapers, we used to build great things. The American right, I hope, can remember that the government is capable of building mighty works too. Admiral Hyman Rickover, the father of the nuclear Navy, spent decades working within the government delivering nuclear-powered submarines on time and under budget to give the U.S. a decisive advantage over the Soviets. This is what the state looks like when engineers, instead of lawyers, are running things. In China, the engineering state literally works because engineers literally rule. As a corrective to the chaos of the Mao years, Deng Xiaoping promoted engineers to the highest ranks of government. By 2002, all nine members of the Politburo's Standing Committee had trained as engineers. Xi Jinping himself studied chemical engineering at Tsinghua, China's top science university. For his third term, he has packed the Politburo with executives from the country's aerospace and weapons ministries, signaling a decisive prioritization of defense and mega-projects. What do engineers like to do? Build. Since Deng's reforms began in 1980, China has built an expanse of highways equal to twice the length of the U.S. Uh, system. It has built a high-speed rail network 20 times more extensive than Japan's, completing around 2 billion passenger trips each year. It has built almost as much solar and wind power capacity as the rest of the world put together. And every single day, the construction continues. China compressed more than a century's worth of American construction into just two decades. Take my travels through Guizhou province. 
Guizhou is China's fourth poorest province, a mountainous place where a common saying goes, not three feet of land is flat, where not three days pass without rain, where not a family has three silver coins. It has the per capita income of Botswana, less than a third of rich coastal cities. Yet, even this poor province has vastly superior infrastructure to America's richest states. It has built 45 of the world's 100 highest bridges. These bridges cut travel time between two remote towns from many hours to a few minutes. Some are bridges to nowhere, but after a few years, they often become somewhere. Um, and this building isn't limited to infrastructure. China's corporate sector is made up of overactive producers. A rough rule of thumb is that China produces one-third to one-half of nearly any manufactured product, structural steel, solar panels, container ships, you name it. This obsession with physical production flows into every sector, including technology. This is the Shenzhen system. When the iPhone was launched in 2007, there was no more natural place for mass production than Shenzhen. Apple's greatest innovation wasn't just the product design, it was the ability to leverage China's ecosystem of manufacturers and workers. As one former Apple engineer told me, the process of bringing components together requires a hand-in-glove partnership. Uh, the key difference is China's focus on uh, process knowledge. Shenzhen has become the world's most innovative hub for electronics production because it has a dense network of suppliers and a massive, experienced workforce. As Apple CEO Tim Cook once noted, in the US, you could hardly fill a room with the tooling engineers needed. But in China, you could fill multiple football fields. When an engineer in Shenzhen has an idea for a new product, everything needed to produce it, from specialized semiconductors to adapters, can be found in a short drive. The coordination that usually takes weeks can be collapsed into a business meeting lasting hours. This massive adaptive workforce is the basis of China's tech power. It's why Chinese firms are now dominating in electric vehicles, batteries, and clean technology. The reduction in solar power costs over the last decade has been driven not by breakthroughs in science, America's strong suit, but by efficient production, China's strength. As one country lost its process knowledge, the US Rust Belt, the other gained whole industries. But the efficiency of the engineering state comes at a terrible uh, self-limiting cost. First, the financial cost. Beneath the gleaming new bridges of Guizhou lurks a massive debt burden. Its super high bridges aren't producing the revenue to recoup their super high costs. The consequence? Guizhou is now one of China's most indebted provinces. This leads to the dark comedy of governance. When a party secretary like Li Zaiyong in Liu Panshui, Guizhou, wanted a promotion, the political system rewarded him for construction. So, he built a cable lift and dozens of artificial snowmakers in a province that gets only a few inches of snow each year, dreaming of a ski town. He built elegant Chinese temples and replicas of European town squares. His efforts failed entirely, the faux European town squares were taken over by black goats, and his chestnut rose bushes died. All the city got for its trouble was $21 billion in new debt. Lai, who was later given a death sentence with a two-year reprieve, put it best. It was the nation's money, not mine. This pursuit of construction, for its own sake, driven by political incentives, means China must constantly build less and build better. Second, the human cost. This brings us to the core problem of the engineering state. It views people as aggregates to be manipulated, not individuals to be protected. The engineering state's ultimate experiments involve social engineering, and the numbers are in the names. I'm speaking, of course, of the one-child policy and zero COVID. The one-child policy is the searing indictment of the engineering state. Its architect was not a social scientist, but a missile scientist named Song Jian. Uh, in the late 1,970 seconds, Song returned from a conference in Helsinki gripped by Western fears of Malthusian catastrophe. He applied cybernetics, the mathematics of control systems to China's population. His deeply flawed straight line projections warned that China would hit 4.5 billion people by the second half of the next century if unchecked. He concluded the optimal population was only 700 million. Song Jian pressed his scientific analysis into the hands of the central leadership. Why did they listen?
because military scientists like Sung were politically trusted, operating with computer printouts and precise numbers, while skeptical demographers used mere abacuses. The crudest goal, uh, one child, uh, was uh, embraced for its very simplicity for the millions of local officials uh, tasked with uh, enforcement. The result was a campaign of rural terror. Enforcement included mass sterilization and abortion campaigns carried out without anesthetic or consent. Local officials, driven by quotas and career advancement, seized livestock, carted women off in hog cages, and induced abortions on women late in their third trimester. Over 35 years, China performed a stunning 321 million abortions and sterilized over 108 million women and 26 million men. This brutality changed the nation forever, leading to millions of missing women and a rapidly aging population. Decades later, the engineering state performed its ultimate act of social control with zero COVID. I lived through all three acts of this tragicomic play, Act 1, 2, 0, 2, 0, Fury and Pride. After Wuhan officials suppressed news of the virus, uh, a weakness in the political system, the state quickly mobilized. The sheer scale of its response, building hospitals in 11 days, shutting down all international travel, induced a sense of pride as the rest of the world bungled its response. Act 2, 2021, Exhaustion and Tension. The state increasingly relied on digital surveillance, the health code app, and layers of control often enforced by the much-feared Dabai Big Whites. Act 3, 2022, Desperation and Collapse. The engineering state grew too literal-minded. Shanghai's April 2022 lockdown was the ultimate failure, confining 25 million people for eight weeks with no prior planning for food logistics. The absurdities mounted. Pet corgis were beaten. A pregnant woman miscarried after a hospital refused entry without a negative PCR test. And medical staff ignored every condition except COVID. When the virus hit Beijing, it triggered resistance, and the policy, which had become a political statement for Xi, collapsed overnight. The same institutional linkage that enforced the one-child policy, the neighborhood committees, is now being repurposed to call recently married women, asking about their menstrual cycles, and urging them to have babies. And the irony is searing. The engineering state is finding that while it had many tools to prevent births, it can't seem to find the right tools to encourage them. The fundamental limit to China's power is the control neurosis of its engineers. So uh, what is the conclusion? The ultimate contest between China and the United States will not be decided by which country has the biggest factory or the highest corporate valuation. It will be won by the country that works best for the people living in it. The US has deep advantages over China, pluralism, intellectual freedom, and a commitment to individual rights. But the engineering state has one powerful card to play. It can harness physical dynamism. China now has greater manufacturing capabilities, a more robust defense industrial base, and more abundant housing. The US will prove itself the stronger country over the next century if it can hold on to pluralism while building more. Right now, it is failing. We can't respond to climate change, drive better economic outcomes, or secure social equality if the physical world remains underdeveloped. We need to gently unwind the dominance of lawyers. We need fewer lawyers focused on litigating the life out of government agencies and more lawyers of the dealmaker bent who are interested in delivery. We need to recover the American ethos of building. I believe that the path forward demands that we reclaim a sense of optimism. Americans need to trust that society can flourish without empowering lawyers to micromanage everything. We need to learn to love engineers again. We must look to our own history and draw on that natural legacy of engineering. Because if we don't, we will continue to lose ground commercially, technologically, and militarily to the engineering state across the Pacific. Um, the stakes are too high for us to remain the lawyerly society that excels only at obstruction.